Hi, everybody. Welcome to Shasad Podcast, conversations between scholars from around the world who study childhood, youth, and related institutions historically. As an official production of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, you can subscribe to these shows through iTunes or Google Play. Written and visual materials associated with each episode are available at our website, shcy.org. Enjoy. Great. Hi. I'm so happy to be here today to be discussing Laura Soderbergh's Vicious Infants, Dangerous Childhoods, and Antebellum U.S. Literature. My name is Mary Zborskis. I am an assistant professor of American Studies and Gender Studies at Penn State Harrisburg, and my research focuses on queer, critical race, and childhood studies in 20th century and contemporary American literature and culture. So I'm thrilled to be here today and to be talking with Laura. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here, Mary. I'm Laura Soderberg. I'm reporting here from the University of Southern Indiana, where I'm an assistant professor in the English department. And I'm so excited that you've decided to join us. Wonderful. All right. Well, as I said, we are here today to talk about vicious infants. And I thought that we could just start by having you, Laura, tell us a little bit about the intellectual journey that led to you writing Vicious Infants. Absolutely. So it is one of those projects where it is not the project I ever thought I would be starting out with, because this is a work that grew out of my dissertation, but going into graduate school, I very much thought I would be working very much more directly on empire and biopolitics. And at some point I took a class with Professor Th Thaddeus Davis where we read the novel Our Nig and realized that Harriet Wilson was capturing all of those things through the very particular facet that is childhood and that she was writing about childhood in a way that was really not something I'd ever seen before. So I just got fascinated with this question of not just how do we define childhood, how do we recognize when childhood is at play, but also what are the kinds of repetitions and continuities, the sort of traces of the systematic that can get captured in childhood. And so that's where I started to hit the archives. And essentially, like any project, I got lucky and I found things and they started to build together into what is hopefully a coherent project. Yeah, well, I think it's incredibly coherent. And I just love um, that answer because the way that you kind of started being, you know, I thought I'd be studying empire and biopolitics and you are studying all those things. And the fact that the child is kind of so central to studying those things, I think is something that you really demonstrate in your work. And, um, you know, once you kind of start looking in the archives for this stuff and children pop up everywhere, right? So it's not necessarily even just getting lucky. It's kind of like that they're so um, constitutive of kind of these uh, questions. And so that is very, very cool to hear about that journey. Um, can you talk a little bit about your archives since you mentioned it? I think that you have such a really exciting range of materials that you're looking at and you do a great job talking about the ways that you're looking at, uh, you know, literary and non-literary texts through these different um, lenses. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, absolutely. And putting together the work of figuring out which archives I could even draw from was a real challenge because part of what I'm so interested in are what are the childhoods that might not have been categorized as childhoods in our archives to date. So I did a lot of creative thinking about, all right, we know that there were kids in prison. What records do we have on those children? What records do we have on basically any kind of child who wasn't getting the star treatment in sentimental novels going out to find them. And as I did that, I had to do a lot of miniature crash, crash courses in how to read things like legal documents, how to read things like medical journals. I spent too much time reading late 18th century and antebellum medical journals, essentially because <laughs> I had to figure out what I was looking at. And Essentially what I found as I approached the archive and what I tried to do in the book was model the ways that literary analysis absolutely still apply to 
archives of all types and specifically the ways that the framings present in those archives then slip back into literature. So thinking through the ways that a document that starts out as a medical article describing an unusual pregnancy then becomes a case study, which then gets parodied in a medical comedy short story, which then gradually diffuses into culture more broadly and shows up in novels we recognize as novels. So like all of a sudden things that were in a medical journal are in Moby Dick. And so I became kind of fascinated by what happens if we stop caring quite so much about all of these boundaries and just say all of these people were talking to one another and reading one another. And it makes sense to put all of these expert texts in the same room as literary texts. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was, I try to pay attention to the particularities of genre when it comes to archives, because those things are important. But the pervasiveness of them, I think, is actually just as important in the ways that one category drifts into another. So that putting strict boundaries is just as artificial. Yeah, no, and I love the way you kind of just describe that kind of circulation and the way that it's really nonlinear and yeah, how do these like, uh, uh, you know, content from medical journals end up in Moby Dick is such a great, um, just just such a great takeaway and question and something that you, I think, I mean, and you you oscillate between these materials, I think, just so adeptly in the um, in Vicious Infants. So, um, and I really like at the start of the your answer, you were talking about just sort of the problem of sometimes finding or identifying these childhoods in the archives because of uh, the ways archives do or don't capture um, some of these children and something that kind of really allows you to access some of these records is the role of institutions and institutions roles and in kind of creating archives that we kind of still have and can access and you um, talk a lot about kind of um, institutions role in the various literatures that you're investigating so it's just wondering if you talk a little bit more about the role of institutions in this project. Oh absolutely because there are institutions everywhere in the project. Um, and it does definitely shape what evidence we have. Um, so for instance, one of the archives I worked with was pairing essentially parenting manuals that were available during the antebellum period. So this was the like how to treat your child so that they grow up to be a good citizen and putting those alongside the disciplinary records of the first juvenile prison in New York and essentially saying that although they're applying it very differently and believe they're out operating at different ends of the spectrum, there is a kind of coherent logic about which children can be physically harmed and how and what the effect will be. But the way that that took shape is I was working in Philadelphia at the time. There was a Philadelphia juvenile prison and I was a graduate student with, without a ton of money. So my initial thought was I'll work on the archive here. <laughs> and I'm not going to worry about microfilm from New York or anything like that. And what I found was I couldn't work with the archives of Philly's juvenile prison, not because they didn't exist, but because the prison still existed. So it mm -hmm. exists now as a school, but it is still a private institution that only grants access to its records by request. Mm -hmm. And so there is still very much a sense that not only in the sort of obvious ways that institutions try to pr promote their own personas, to promote their own interests, as things are getting recorded, there's also a real question of which records are we even still allowed to access? And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there is a lot of information that still has to be filtered through the power of those records. So for, inst for another example, in my chapter, working partly with Arnig, I look a lot at indenture contracts. And so yeah. these were the records that were drawn up for either poor or orphaned or children declared poor or orphaned, which isn't always the same thing. Um, children to be essentially housed and given, selling their labor to families nominally in exchange for care. Um, but what's interesting is how little we can get from those records. They're very, very formal. So a lot of the indentures are not handwritten. They're actually fill in the blank. And in the midst of that, 
you get a fill in the blank standardized document, which varies place from place time to time, but is obviously set up to be predetermined. And then mm -hmm. at the bottom, you often get children signing the document, sometimes with just an X, sometimes with just their name. Most of the time, it was an entire formality. It wasn't legally required at all. But thinking through, this is an institution of law that somehow really wants this child's X to be recorded for yeah. some reason that's not actually included in the document or the law. So thinking through what kind of glimpse the institution of indenture is giving us of the individual child themselves and yeah. what tactics are behind what they want us to see when we look there. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, I'm reading institutions much more than I'm reading the children's perspectives themselves, partly because that is so much of the evidence we have. Literature can yes. supplement that, but it certainly can't totally surmount it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, that is, I mean, that's just absolutely fascinating. And like you're saying the, what is revealing about institutions, institutional approaches to these children, desires for these children, and just ways that we kind of have some of these gaps around what we can even know about it, but um, what information we can glean is so fascinating. And it's so interesting kind of the ways that some of these records are, um, are still private or if there's still kind of issues accessing um, these children. That's just so interesting because of the ways that you're thinking about kind of which children or how children are even able to occupy public space or they get secluded to these privatized settings that is supposed to mitigate their ways of occupying the public in the future as citizens, as adults, you know? And so, um, so just kind of seeing that that resonate in kind of the methods and, and having this, uh, you know, just kind of still being ongoing now is so interesting. Thank you. And I, I should do justice. In fairness, I was not only a broke grad student, I was a shy one. I technically <laughs> didn't apply for access. So totally. I don't want to maybe, maybe they would have been generous, but they no, still yeah. have but, the power but there. Saying, absolutely. But that just that there are these kind of hurdles that kind of keep, um, keep hidden these, these records or just kind of create, um, you know, bureaucratic barriers toward even being able to try to, to, to um, illuminate them, right, or, or, or access them. Yeah. Um, I would love at this moment to talk about this very intriguing title, Vicious Infants, because it is not just there to be, it, it's not there to be provocative, it is a, it's a very deliberate um, historical uh, term, and so I would just love if you could talk a little bit about how you got to this title and how it's kind of an entry point into the text. Yeah, so what's fascinating to me is that most of the time when I tell people this title, Vicious Infants, the gut reaction is essentially like, that sounds like a death metal band. Yeah. And that's because- <laughs> It probably <it's>, is, <laughs> or should be. Someday. Yeah. But our, that's our... because it's so oxymoronic to our ears. We, it's very, very difficult to conceptualize an infant as having even sufficient agency to encompass malice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So thinking through how much things have shifted to know that that is a phrase that gets people's react, uh, gets a reaction out of people, but that it was an operant legal term. Yeah. There were children who were labeled vicious infants by the law and the result of being labeled the vicious infant was that you were functionally going to be imprisoned until you were 18 or 20 or older, depending on the system you were in. Because the idea of the vicious infant is someone who is a minor. So infant means classified as a minor, which is also meaning can't speak in the public sphere. So someone who is excluded mm -hmm. from the public sphere, but vicious also in the sense that there they are regarded as being irredeemable on some level. And so that convergence of saying you are both not in the public sphere and you are being regarded by the state as dangerous functionally produces a warehousing mentality where the state feels endless justification to keep children out of public life and to do so under the pretense that it's for their protection. This is where the infancy bit comes in. So this is the kind of childhood that is harder to recognize because it is so fundamentally bound up in doing harm to the children it attaches to or is attached to. And so I find Vicious Infants a really nice encapsulation of what I'm 
trying to do in the book, which is talk about the ways that antebellum childhood wasn't just um, exclusive to the sort of like affluent white children who were treated as sentimental angels, future citizens. Those are all very real formations that had powerful effects in culture, but also that there were lots of childhoods that absolutely categorized people by their age as a status and hurt them as a result. So thinking mm -hmm. through the ways that state power translates into classification and injury. And that's what the book as a whole is really trying to get after. Yeah, and it, it absolutely does. And I um, just love the way that you phrase that because it reminds me of what I just think is such a really um, a powerful quotation in the intro. You talk about how this that sentimental or the angelic child never existed without the delinquent, the apprentice, the prodigy. And so just really showing how these vicious infants are really co-constitutive of that image of the, the sentimental, the angelic child, right? Like that those are the, they allow us, to, like that you you can't be looking at that innocent child without having these, um, these other children kind of not just in the shadow, but really bolstering that construction. And you, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that I, I mentioned the parallels between parenting, parenting manuals and prison records. And that's not to make a sort of cute point of like, oh, parents are disciplining, discipline is like a prison. It's actually to say that parents were using the logic that kept juvenile delinquents out of something like civic life. Mm -hmm. And we're doing everything possible to treat that as the warning limit case for what they must steer their children away from. Mm -hmm. So it was very much a, because those children exist, I will model my parenting in this way and define my child in opposition to those other children who don't qualify for this kind of attention. Um, yeah. Lydia Mariah Child is someone who normally was a big proponent of rejecting all kinds of corporal punishment. She wrote about how if you hit a child, it teaches them to act good but conceal evil. And she's very of that movement to say that there is not a justification for corporal punishment. And then she also says in the first edition of her book, of course, sometimes you'll get a child from outside of the house come into your house. And at that point, you might need to hit them. And her logic is essentially the bond between parent and child, which is also a bond that affixes the kind of genealogical statuses of, say, whiteness or class, doesn't exist to stabilize a relationship, and so in comes violence. Mm. She's essentially saying that the thing that marks your children as separate won't necessarily apply to these other children. Mm. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, like the way that these kind of um, exceptions get mapped onto these other children um, is so interesting. And I really like how in the book, one of the kind of frameworks that you provide for us about thinking about different childhoods um, is through the category of sociability and kind of which children are soci sociable, sociable, <laughs> and which are antisocial um, and how that relates to their ability to participate um, in future civic life in the public. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about just that framework. Thank you to such a, um, a generative one um, for, for approaching these children. Thank you, yeah. So what I was trying to think about is the ways that we often think of individuality as humanizing for mm -hmm. children. So thinking through the like quintessential ruffian or you know the little girl with the skin knee type characters. And that's our framework for saying, oh yeah, this is a child worthy of protection, worthy of humanity, et cetera. Yeah. And I think in the antebellum period, it's very, very much not the case. I think generic children were seen as extremely desirable in a strange way because they were the children who were connected to this kind of more generalized sense of population. So the idea that, you know, as Carrie Hyde's work has shown, there wasn't a stable sense of citizenship in the law. The US was very much ad-libbing next generation logics for what the nation's futurity would be. Mm -hmm. And so models of sociability stepped in to say, 
that people were, that adults were able to recognize versions of themselves in children and therefore were able to connect those children with the continuation of the nation. So two examples for that. One, you mentioned Prodigy. That's actually where the medical journals come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so it, this is great if it has you talking about Moby Dick, because I feel like Moby Dick is just very hot again on like Twitter and stuff. So I thought you were saying Mo- poor Moby Dick doesn't get its due. <laughs> oh, no, it is like if like if you aren't reading Moby Dick right now, then you're like, what are you even? Doing? I don't know who you're antisocial. You're, you're, the you're trick saying. is to always be halfway through rereading Moby Dick and mm-hmm. then just stopping. So you're still technically reading it at all times. I love that strategy. So yeah, I'm definitely giving it as hypothetical. Yes. <laughs> yeah, not at all your, <laughs> your mode. Great. Well, anyway, but, sorry. Yes, yeah, go back no, to no, medical no. skills so, and prodigy. And prodigy. Yes. <laughs> so, prodigy is an interesting category because the way it worked is that it but as a word, it both means something miraculous in the way that we mean it now, but it could also mean something monstrous. And it was used to, that doubleness was essentially used to classify black infancy, especially in medical journals as inherently aberrant. And so there's this conception that by the 19th century, um, models of race have largely stabilized to being about heredity. So it's about who your family is there are limits and complications to that, of course. But what I'm trying to point out is that at the beginning of the 19th century, even the idea of heredity itself was racialized. So that you have all of these doctors who fixate on moments of black birth as being moments of breakage in genealogy. That's bound up with a lot of things because it tends to be images of white mothers giving birth to black children or children that the doctors are, interpreting as black. It's not always a straightforward thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And those doctors always read that moment as coming from nowhere. Mm -hmm. So it's a negation of genealogy for black families Um, that is then used by contrast to support white genealogy and white continuity between generations. And so thinking through that kind of racialization of predictability also then models out to how is the nation thinking about itself if the nation has sort of if uh, i'm using the nation as if it's a person which i always hate um (laughs) if white people in the u.s internalize this idea that their children are theirs and that black children are nobodies Mm -hmm. then it also allows them to think through citizenship as being inherited through white families Yes. Whereas Black genealogy doesn't encompass citizenship. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I trace that to Moby Dick. Yeah. Partly by of thinking course. about Pip, um, <laughs> who's this figure who is sometimes labeled a child, sometimes labeled an adult, mm-hmm. and is identified as coming from Alabama and Connecticut, who is essentially always in exile on the ship of exiles. And he is one of many children of color in the text who are cut off from genealogy in that way. Um, And so I'm just, I'm thinking through how that cultural imaginary that aligns Blackness with anti-genealogy also then allows for white authors to more easily say Blackness is itself more antisocial and that Black children can't be the face of the nation yeah. because they're fundamentally excluded from it. Um, I started to say two examples, but that was a long enough one that I think I'll cap it there. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, I thought, I mean, it's a really, really powerful example and how, yeah, these ways that um, medicine becomes a site for kind of constructing these um, narratives of extra of Black children's extrication from kinship, which then justifies um, extrication from the nation from future adult citizenship is, um, yeah, uh, um, you you really demonstrate that so powerfully in the text, and um, yeah, and uh, this is why we are not post Moby Dick. So, <laughs> no, never. Yeah, I should um, also mention this was always something that was continually contested. So, mm-hmm. in the book I also, alongside Moby Dick, read this brilliant work by Susan Paul, who mm-hmm. is talking about. It's a memoir of a little boy who died. I think five or six. Uh, it's in the title, and I'm. Blanking or, or maybe five years. I just taught it. Sorry, not to cut you off. But yes. Well, the point is, is that he isn't the obvious subject for something like a memoir, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. except through traditions of child hagiography, where he is saintly and also so transcendent of anything as small as biological genealogy. He is dying of illness and the doctor comes to see him and the little boy tries to convert the doctor, essentially telling us that biology is not what's at play here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested in that too, moment too of Paul saying, all right, white culture is trying to exclude black children from genealogy and therefore try to exclude them from the US nation. That might also be an opening to say that there's something better out there, mm -hmm. to say that it's possible to think of kinship and think of relation in more utopian terms that aren't just bound up in biology or straightness or national futurity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is so important to be emphasizing because that is such a strong undercurrent of your of vicious infants as well, that there um, are all of these ways that um, children and authors and like texts themselves are these sites of resistance or are trying to enact resistance, their intention with these kind of narratives that are circulating and being imposed and kind of determining these, you know, institutional approaches and cultural approaches. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a, a really, really nice example of that. And if I would love to hear if you have more to say about kind of that, that tension and kind of these, um, these moments of resistance, even if they're kind of hard to, to ascertain and some, some, just given kind of what access we do have to some of these stories. No, absolutely. And this is, I'm continually inspired by work done in Black girlhood studies because it's mm. doing so much vital work in recovering these alternative models. Um, one way I was seeing resistance also in the text that I was looking at is also in the opposite movement. Um, so at the very end of the book, I read uh, Harry Beecher Stowe as actually demonizing white childhood by mm -hmm. white childhood's own logic. And that feels like a moment of resistance too. So mm -hmm. thinking about moments where Harry Beecher Stowe is saying, all right, a lot of books seem to end with white children being born who then mark a future that is heroic and utopian. And we can end this book because there's a new generation coming in. And then she writes Dread, which mm -hmm. has a ton of Malthusian elements and ends with an escaped black man who should by all rights be in freedom, pushing around a little white baby who is said to be the very spirit of her Virginia, I think Virginian, Southern certainly ancestors. And it's profoundly disquieting in the text. Yeah. It's a moment where white childhood is quite obviously accumulating and repeating violence rather mm -hmm. than erasing it. So yeah. that's one version of resistance. I'm also, I also look at authors, like I'll stop talking about Harriet Wilson's, but I pair her uh, with the work of William Apis, yes. who was a Pequot writer and wrote about his own childhood as essentially a continual negotiation with all of these legal forms trying to bracket him in. And one of the ways I think about that is that in his narrative, he's continually referring to, I agreed to this contract, but I didn't understand it, or but I understood it on my own terms. And he is continually doing this sort of very limited buy-in. He's mm. thinking, all right, I'll agree to this on these grounds. So he joins the army, but he explains that I joined the army to be a drummer. So as soon as they tried to make me a soldier, I figured our contact contract was over and I left. He gets arrested for de desertion. He joins a denomination. He believes he's joined the denomination on certain grounds and that those grounds have been violated. So he leaves again. Mm -hmm. And each time he's continually marking, I agreed to this, but when I needed to leave, it was not at all in conflict for me. And I think that is a moment of resistance too, where he's essentially yeah. parroting versions of the social contract. Yes. These moments where we see children, especially child characters, being made to buy into society as it is and being asked to give some kind of emotional investment to show that they've really internalized it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not only is he refusing to buy into a social contract where it's irreparable consent, where it's consent without terms, he's also giving a version of the social contract where 
he remains separate in a very important sense. Yes. He is never as emotionally bound by these contracts as, say, the denomination wants him to be. Yeah. And so that gives him a, ma a measure of mobility, even if it's not security or safety or anything like that. And so I think that's an interesting model of what childhood can do too. Absolutely. And I, I really just loved hearing your uh, kind of description of that uh, kind of moment or, or that, that mode of repeating the contract of them being like, well, that's not a conflict for me as the site of resistance, because it reminds me of some of the really beautiful work that you do in your conclusion. You have that, it reminds me of the reading that you have of Zikla Shah, where she, um, uh, uh, you, you describe it as like, she has this way of um, finding a way to grow into the future that is exceeding or outside of frameworks of citizenship, but that is about kind of her own interiority or sense of self that remains private, actually, like that does not get um, presented as like a resolution that is accessible, but that for her is resolution and how that's a moment of resistance. And so I just, I, I, I just think that that is, a, I really like that interpretation and approach. Thank you. There's a really hard balance that I try to strike where I always want to note moments of resistance, but I want to avoid romanticizing them. Of course. So yeah. I, I want to pay attention to the ways that being excluded from sentimental childhood mm -hmm. could also give ground to imagining different, less harmful childhoods, yes. but also came with real physical danger and at tremendous cost. So mm -hmm. it's, it's always a sort of negotiation for me of, I want to pay attention to resistance, but I don't want to erase injury either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, and I, I think you, I think you balance that really well in the work. And yeah, like I, um, and I think it's so important. And you're not doing this, like to, like it's important not to, like exactly what you're saying, not to be romanticizing these moments or kind of over weighing them while also not ignoring them or not seeing them as what was available to children or young adults, kind of as they were really having to just negotiate these really. Um, uh, just really oppressive systems and kind of conditions of day-to-day -day survival. So, yeah, um, I would love to uh, go to to some stuff that you discussed in the conclusion, which I think is just so powerful. You know, um, and if you could just talk to our listeners about your thoughts on vicious infants today. You know, you're you're talking about how it's so important to be looking at these antebellum histories because of the historical continuities that get illuminated when we're looking at these um, 19th century narratives. And, you know, and you mentioned this in your conclusion, you know, um, the criminalization of youth of color, uh, the detaining of migrant children at the border, the infantilization of disabled children um, are kind of all instances, I think, of uh, children who continue to be deemed antisocial. So I'd just love to hear you talk a little bit more about those historical continuities and um, how that comes up for you in, in this work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I sometimes tell my students that one of the weird things about studying the 19th century is being faced with all the ways it keeps happening. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, we're in the very long 19th century still. <laughs> so. Always long, always going. <laughs> always already. <laughs> um, so while I was working on this project in fairly early stages, for instance, research started to come out that was establishing through quantitative metrics through all of the sort of good STEM research, that essentially the cultural formation of the so-called crack baby was just that. Mm -hmm. It was a differentiation that had to do with access to medical care, access to resources, and essentially accesses to safety, security, privileges. Without those differences, there was not a significant difference between children who were categorized as so-called crack babies and children who weren't. Mm -hmm. It was entirely a kind of de facto warehousing mm -hmm. of saying, these are the people who might under law qualify as citizens, but have been deemed by the structures of society to never be on the trajectory towards citizenship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's a harnessing of race, it's a harnessing of disability to exclude people before they're even adults, to write them off and write off their potential and thus to exclude them from the kinds of investment that states that the state makes in children quite often. So it's a way of saying, all right, educational resources can't be put towards these kids 
or it's a way of saying, all right, yeah, juvenile delinquency, that's already the path they're on. And so I think it is possible to really focus on the ways that the rhetoric of the US holds up childhood as this thing that is protected and held dear, and in practice is not, um, mm -hmm. or in practice is held dear for white children, affluent children, children who aren't racialized or marginalized. Um, and that we see the focus on social or institutional or state perceptions of something like potential mm -hmm. as a way of justifying neglect in the present. Yes. I think that that is just um, incredibly powerful the way you put all of that. And of course, as you're talking, I'm thinking about um, other ways that we sort of see the revelation of this like ostensible care for children and the neglect of them and how the, that neglect is going to be exacerbated along race, class, ability lines um, by looking at the current crisis that we're in, um, you know, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, you know, um, and as I was reading, I was really just struck by some resonances in vicious infants, in vicious infants between kind of terms and themes that come up in some of the conversations today around children and COVID, you know, how lockdowns are impacting their development specifically around sociability, um, but then how that sociability is dangerous for adults uh, that might have to be around and, and doing the work and showing up for these children. But of course, this like concern about um, childhood and development and proper schooling um, is hyper increased because it's white and middle and upper middle class families that are now being impacted by this, you know, as we know, um, access to education, conditions for healthy development have been ongoing um, concerns for children of color, poor children, disabled children, um, that of course have only been exacerbated by COVID, but though you don't get to be at the front of these conversations. So I just right. like to hear and those Oh, sorry, yeah, exactly. I'm just going to add that the white affluent families are also the most likely to be shielded from the effects of COVID in any exactly. case. Exactly, yes. And that they're kind of the ones that are getting to kind of, or, or yeah, ju just the way that they, um, the space that they get to take up and just sort of the, all the naughty issues around it. So I would just love to hear um, any thoughts that you have on what Vicious Infants has to contribute to kind of our contemporary moments thinking about children, vulnerability, and danger. No, we're at the, we're, I am both, so I'm in, I'll start out with the proviso. I'm incredibly sympathetic to how hard it would be to be a parent right now. Like that oh, goes without saying. 1000% and it's- Or to be uh, a child right now. Yeah, this pandemic has totally kind of hard to be right children now. and parents, especially single parents, people without resources, communities, family nearby, um, Un working parents, yeah. Yeah, unbelievably difficult. And at the same time, some of that is being funneled into something starting to be a moral panic mm -hmm. about these children who don't know how to smile because they wear masks yes. or children who don't know how to communicate with each other because part of their face is covered. And there is something incredibly antebellum, partly because there was this belief that infants had fundamental connection to their mothers, that even before words, they could interpret their mother's smiles. Mm. And that that performance of something like genealogical affect, where you see a child being able to understand and connect emotionally with a parent, and model that through a face specifically becomes the anchor point for the parent to be like, all right, I know I don't know what's going on in the kid's head, but there's somehow a part of me enough that it's not as stressful. I can trust that they will be something like a stable repetition of who I am. And I think where a lot of these concerns are coming from is this perception that parents are increasingly faced with the reality that their children are living different childhoods than they had. Mm -hmm. And that comes with incredible anxiety. It would naturally be a source of stress, but it's also getting funneled through these very particular ways that because these children aren't necessarily getting to smile at each other in the way that parents know how to recognize that as social interaction, mm -hmm. they therefore assume that children aren't having social interactions of other kinds. Whereas obviously things like texting might not have existed in quite the same ways when these parents were young. Yeah, so yeah. some of this is about socialization that's shifting mm -hmm. and 
adults saying this isn't the soci sociability I recognize and yeah. therefore it's intrinsically dangerous. Yeah, I think that that is really, really insightful. And this sort of desire, I mean, it, a lot of it just goes back to desires about what childhood should be or what universal experiences of childhood should be and kind of the anxieties, the panics that come up um, when there are, are shifts from that or uh, deviations from that, so yeah. And completely um, shot through with the ableism of saying the children who are immune suppressed or otherwise extra vulnerable are not the priority for state making decisions. Oh, they're completely left out of these conversations. And uh, so, yeah, I think that that is, and that's what is so, um, I mean, just to kind of see those patterns being repeated and kind of, again, which children are being, or um, people caring about, which families, which um, kind of caretakers, um, concerns and anxieties are, are really getting to be at the foreground of these conversations is, um, you know, that, that we have historical basis for how that happens. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> that is a good way of putting that. We know uh, what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I'll uh, ask a final question. Uh, you know, you, you know, we have the final form of vicious infants, and I'm sure there's stuff that didn't get to make it in here or things that might exist kind of, um, in an ancillary relationship with the text, um, you know, are there unanswered questions for you um, or things that you're kind of picking up on now that you are kind of in a different space and temporal relationship to, to vicious infants? Oh, absolutely. It turns out the experience of writing a book is needing to immediately want to rewrite it to make it much, much yes. better because <laughs> you learn a lot. Um, so a couple of threads that I definitely would love to push on in the future, given the thing already exists and I can't change the past, um, is one that I'm super interested by this pattern I recognized in juvenile delinquency uh, records where the boys who were considered not fit to work on the land, mm -hmm. um, and I'll note all of the different ways that that uh, figured. Um, so this was the, the best way to leave the juvenile prison was to get indentured out usually to a farmer, um, yeah. both to provide labor for society and because associations between white childhood and nature, something, mm -hmm. something. Um, the children who were seen as disciplined enough to do that tended to get sent on whaling vessels or oh. naval vessels, but essentially they were put on ships for two to three years with the idea that either they would learn to obey or that the ship would keep them in line in the meantime. Whoa, so, so it really does all come back to Moby Dick. <laughs> exactly. So there is an absolute way that ships operated as functionally privatized pr prisons for yeah. boys. Now, I was looking at a phase of juvenile delinquency in New York where it was very much the white kids getting imprisoned. This is mm -hmm. just the first 10 years or so, essentially because the black kids were excluded from the privileged category, the relative privileged category of juvenile delinquency, they were still getting sent to the city adult prisons. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of this, you know, I'd love to do more digging on how as those racial shifts change, how were privatized prisons like ships also shifting roles? So are Black children similarly put aboard ships? Are they seen as eligible for that level of mobility? Are they not? And also to some extent, if we must do Melville, what happens if we read Melville as partly operating as a prison at sea? Yeah, oh my gosh, this is so fascinating, especially because of like ships, uh, like, amorphous status with the law and and uh, whose laws it abides by maritime laws it's developing and stuff and then um, I'm thinking about also the kind of the sites where um, uh, children who are, are seen as having like um, criminal potential or, or uh, wayward futures kind of get um, sent to these different places of the land now um, you know as our uh, uh, icon Paris Hilton has revealed to us kind of all these different wilderness programs and stuff that are um, just really abusive sites um, and uh, and do repeat exactly this dynamic of like s claiming to, to save and help and reform these children while um, really um, inciting trauma that might impede their ability to um, 
access the future. But just anyway, oh my yeah, gosh, that's so absolutely. fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other thing I'd really like to push on is, as I was saying, this is very much a text that is working a lot with institutional documents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as I was as I was going through those institutional documents, I occasionally came across just glancing references to how the people recorded in those documents could have accessed and read their own documents. Mm -hmm. So not just thinking through like, how do I read this so that I can get into the mind of the people writing it, into the mind of the administrators, into the minds of the adults, but also thinking through what happens with archives when we really focus on them as being something that the people they were recording read, accessed, used in their own ways. So like, for instance, there is uh, one delinquency record that includes a letter from the then adult inmate saying, could you please mail this rec a copy of this record to me? I'd like to use it. Mm. And I don't know what they wanted their record for. Yeah, It's such a strange moment, but I'd like to do more work thinking along those lines of how can we take these records and start to divorce them from being defined by institutional use and think about the kinds of secondary makeshift additional uses they were put to. So what happens when we think about people and children taking ownership of those records for themselves? Wow, oh my gosh, I am so excited to read like your next book already. So so get on it. Um, and you know, once you do that, then we'll start talking about our um, you know, emo band Vicious Infants and um, you know, where and when, you know, what conferences we'll be performing at and stuff. So uh stay tuned. Um Absolutely. oh my gosh, well Laura, really, this was such I love hearing you talk about childhood and uh, race, citizenship, history of medicine, temporality, futurity, and it's just uh, it's such, such a gift to hear you talk about this book. I'm so happy it's out in the world. Congratulations, and uh, yeah, just thank you for taking the time to talk with me a little bit more about it today. Thank you so much. It was a really generous and generative set of questions. I so appreciate it. It's a very, very generous text, so thank you for writing Vicious Infants for us. Thank you for listening to Shusai Podcasts. You can find more materials and features from the Society for the History of Children and Youth online. shcy.org.